Um, I'm probably the only one who's actually dumb enough to get up here and tell you that uh, I don't actually care about quantum error correction. Okay. I don't. My background's in computer systems, right? What I care about is building large-scale quantum computer system architectures, right? Now, so that means that we gotta have some error correction, right? Because nobody's building perfect uh, qubits yet. At least nobody that's uh, come and talk to me. All right, so the basic idea of what I'm talking about is uh, the concept is a quantum multi-computer. For those of you without a background in um, systems architecture, a multi-computer is a collection of smaller computers that are all wired together to solve one problem concurrently. It's a parallel system. It's a, uh, an, an old word. All right, so here's sort of a uh, canonical image of a uh, multi-computer node. You got something, uh, some sort of device in the middle with uh, some qubits in it, and at least one of those connects to the outside world in some sort of quantum method. We've been assuming, typically, uh, the Q bus mechanism for interconnecting uh, systems, but that's mostly irrelevant to the kinds of things I'm going to talk about. And you can see that what I've drawn up here, you might assume it's uh, some sort of solid state device inside a, an Oxford Dill fridge, and we all know what Oxford Dill fridges look like, right? An Oxford Dill fridge looks something like that. Uh, this is a page from a, uh, from a, uh, a Japanese uh, manga. And uh, up there on the right, one of the characters is saying, uh, computer ga ni naru, or a, a quantum computer becomes necessary. Um, of course, what they're doing with it is Roger Penrose style uh, uh, quantum consciousness work in it, but we'll sort of ignore that, right? <laughs> um, so we want to take a bunch of those and we want to connect them up into a larger system, some sort of multi-computer system. And it doesn't really terribly matter much um, what type of devices they are. Any type of device you're talking about is going to have some sort of limit to the number of qubits you can fit inside the device. And uh, if you'll give me more than one of those devices and let me connect them up together, then I'm going to argue that I can use them to solve some sort of larger problem than you can with any individual device. So that's the goal here. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on the uh, multi-computer uh, research. There's a string of papers which are cited here at the bottom on this and related topics. But architecture-wise, uh, the kinds of questions we care about. First, how many nodes do you have in your system? Right. How many qubits per node do you have to have, both in a logical and, and in a physical sense? Uh, the network topology, which I've highlighted up there in red, tends to be sort of ignored in various uh, proposals for this kind of system, but it turns out to actually have a very big impact on the overall performance of your system. But I'm not going to go into that really today. Uh, and then uh, there are certainly issues around the design of your links that you use to carry the, 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 uh, the information from system to system. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those. Software-wise, I'm not really going to talk today about applications and about language design. What we're here to talk about is the error management, the quantum error correction, and uh, there won't be any details in this talk on uh, the purification for teleportation, but that's certainly a subtext uh, for what's going on here. And tomorrow, one of, the, one of the guys that I've been collaborating with, Thaddeus Ladd, is going to be giving a, a talk on that. So um, I'll leave the details of those sorts of things to him. Let's see. So link design. Um, got a string of nodes up there at the top. They're all connected into a line via some sort of QBus architecture. You can see that your basic choices are you're going to connect these in either serial fashion, fashion or a parallel fashion. Right. That makes sort of sense. Um, it turns out that the uh, serial connections actually have a lot of advantages. Obviously, in terms of physical packaging, it means you only have to run one connector instead of n connectors. And it turns out that that actually works well enough for a lot of purposes, provided you meet a particular constraint on your memory. And the particular constraint is that the memory error rate is on the order of one to two orders of magnitude lower than the error rate of your teleportation operation itself. Um, and that's some of the work that we've done here. We, and we've found that two levels of the 2317 Golay code uh, will allow you to operate with a pretty good chance of success for, with a physical teleportation error rate of on the order of 1% when you're talking about a system that's large enough to you to run Shor's factoring algorithm on a 1024-bit uh, on number, which is a pretty good-sized system. Right. Now, one of the complex things about this is um, we have assumed that individual nodes hold 
a multiple of a number of logical qubits. And uh, there were some relatively good reasons for that, but we'll, we, uh, we'll discuss in a minute some of the uh, relaxation of some of that constraints. But one of the primary reasons is that if you have data that's spread out among multiple nodes, then you have to have an ability to create and use distributed logical zero states across multiple nodes. And then that involves um, teleportation again, and then that has a dramatic impact on the uh, fidelity of your teleportation operations that you need to make. And this work is discussed in uh, a paper that's in the IEEE Transactions on Computers, which uh, the editor for quantum material for that is the illustrious uh, Professor Todd Brunn. And, uh, I highly recommend working with them. That was a, uh, it was a pleasure. Um, let's see. So link design, I'm not going to really go into any more detail about that. But you know, getting away from the science fiction, the multi-computer design, there have actually been a series of proposals that have come out within the last few years that fall in different points of the spectrum in terms of what I think of as multi-computer architectures. In the upper left up here, the one by... Uh, uh, Daniel Loy and uh, Simon DeWitt, Simon's here, and Lloyd Hollenberg, um, connecting multiple small ion traps by some sort of optical multiplexer. And you'll notice that they don't say anything about the, uh, the internals of that multiplexer. Now, that's the kind of problem that I care about, but it's not the kind of problem that many of the physicists care much about. Um, on the right hand over here, from Zhang Zheng Kim and, uh, and another Kim, a paper that just showed up uh, recently, but is an extension of work that they've been doing on scalable ion trap architectures. They're talking about uh, connecting a set of nodes through an actual uh, optical cross-connect in a switch using micromechanical systems. And you know, Zhang Zheng being one of the world leaders in that area, I would have faith in uh, what Zhang Zheng told me about it. In the lower left-hand corner here, um, is an abstraction of design by uh, Liang Zhang and uh, Jake Taylor and some others, my uh, collaborators on this. And what they're proposing is a system that uses basically five physical qubits inside uh, one node. And then uh, what that turns into is just a single data bit per node. So in that sense, it's uh, sort of a, a degenerate system uh, that your first level interconnect winds up being essentially your teleportation based interconnect. Right. So the design that we were working on, we were assuming multiple logical qubits per node. Certainly enough physical qubits in, in, in a node to hold at least one logical qubit all the way at your top level. Right. But uh, that's sort of where things were at the end of the, uh, the work on the, uh, the paper that's in Transactions on Computers. That's where we were earlier this year when uh, Jake and Liang showed up and said, well, what about these devices we've got? We're building these small devices. Can they be used to, for this sort of work as well? Right. So um, now we're looking at smaller nodes. The question is how you're going to go about using it. The upper left system, they're talking about something on the order of 14 qubits per node, which they believe is uh, big enough to run one level of uh, 513 code inside uh, an individual node. Um, the system down here at the bottom, like I said, is one data qubit. The rest are for measurement and purification and one transceiver qubit for connecting to your actual optical interconnect. The, uh, the scalable architecture from Kim and Kim um, is a few hundred physical qubits per node, so it's probably large enough to hold one individual uh, logical qubit at some reasonable code size. OK, so how are we going to go about using those? Um, what we would really like to have, you know, this is sort of the, the end point of the architecture we were at a, uh, just uh, a few months ago was we were assuming sort of three to 5,000 physical qubits per node, which is sort of a reasonably large system. Right? Uh, now, obviously, those smaller nodes, you know, they're not, none of those systems are going to reach that kind of level. Right? Um, but when you replace the, uh, the entire interconnect with, for example, in this system here, which I just referred to as degenerate, what you're left with is now your teleportation system ha essentially has to meet your entire threshold argument for um, what the quality of your uh, two qubit gates are in order to, to be able to run error correction properly. OK. So does that hold true? Well, one of the things we're going to need for this is uh, a process we've called partial bell measurement. This is, again, assuming a handful of qubits in a node. What we're going to do is we're going to create a cat state within each one of the nodes, and then we'll use this partial bell measurement to uh, connect them together into one larger cat state, which we'll then use for syndrome extraction for uh, error correction. Okay. Now, you've all seen the 913 uh, shore code and uh, the stabilizers for it. We're going to take that. What we're going to do is we're going to divide it up into a uh, 
into a uh, set of multi-computer nodes. So we're going to take that stabilizer and we'll rewrite it that way. And similarly, we'll take the Z stabilizers and uh, rewrite them that way, giving us you know, our total set of um, eight stabilizers for this. All right. Now, assuming we've got nodes that hold, for example, three qubits each, we're going to take that and divide it up into the red node, the green node, and the uh, blue node. And in order to calculate the uh, the eigenvalue for this stabilizer, or the syndrome for, for this particular part of the error correction, if you prefer, uh, we're going to need one partial vowel measurement that connects across two of those nodes. And that one uh, partial vowel measurement will consume uh, two bell pairs, which we uh, use for uh, fault tolerance purposes. It's both verified using the two bell pairs. Right. And similarly, for the, for the uh, related uh, stabilizer for the other one, we need one partial bell measurement between the, uh, the other two nodes. Now it turns out that the rest of the set of the stabilizers, all of these use um, cat states that do not have to span an individual node. They run uh, entirely in, one, in uh, one node. So the total number of bell pairs that we have to, to consume for one round of error correction at this level is just uh, four bell pairs. Okay, that's at the physical level. All right, so what about um, concatenation? Okay. Now we're going to take three of those smaller nodes, or nine of those smaller nodes, and uh, create, um, again, we'll group them into, th into uh, three groups there, the red, the green, and the blue, because that works well with our uh, layout for, for the code. Uh, it turns out, you can see in the upper right here, we're going to need a full transversal measurement between all of the pairs, corresponding pairs of qubits for the 2Z node uh, stabilizer. And that means uh, nine pairs times the, uh, times the, uh, the, uh, the two pairs for, for doing the partial bell measurement. And of course, there's six stabilizers like that. So we're looking at a total of 108 bell pairs there at the top. At the bottom, the uh, X stabilizers full transversal operations across the set of uh, logical qubits there, 27 qubits times uh, 2 times 2. And so we're looking at a total of, um, on the order of uh, 250, that's the data point there in the middle, 252 physical bell pairs to run the uh, error correction on a two-level concatenated 913 code. Right. So that's the number of bell pairs that we need in order to pull this off, which translates into, if you're going to match this up to a threshold, means since you need 250 uh, teleportations that are going to operate with something that, that allows us to get an improved error rate out of the end of the, our operation compared to this. Okay. Now compare that, uh, the, the number at the top there, with, it, with one data qubit per node, we're talking about 400 bell pairs each, right? so we're talking about a reduction from 400 to 250. That's not, not such a dramatic improvement. Right? If you go all the way down, or if you increase your node size from, from that one qubit to three qubits to nine qubits. So now at nine qubits, we've got the entire first level in the, uh, in the physical nodes. Um, it still is not such a dramatic reduction. It's a couple of hundred. Right. And then, of course, for, that will allow your uh, first level error correction to be a little bit faster. So it's more like um, your memory is closer to perfect. But the total number of operations you need in order to actually run this is, is not so dramatically different. Plus, on the order of 81 bell pairs per logical gate or, or teleportation. Right. So observations. Uh, all these codes require some sort of entanglement between the nodes. We know that. That's obvious. Some of the syndromes are, are measured purely locally. Others require, others are harder and require this entanglement. Um, ways of mitigating this. John talked about this this morning. There was another talk about it as well. Match it to the error type. Um, biased error model. What we have essentially is we have an asymmetric memory interconnect. We have high quality connections in, in one dimension and lower quality connections in another dimension. Perhaps we can match that to the, uh, the physical system for uh, appropriate things. Now, we also believe that, that uh, the Bacon Shore codes relax some of the constraints on, on how you operate this. Um, we haven't been able to pin down exact numbers on that yet, but we believe that there's room for some improvement in there. In order to do the detailed performance calculation, though, you need to separate out the, uh, the cost of doing the bell pair creation from the cost of actually doing the teleportation. So just to, to wrap up here real quick, um, the small nodes are not ideal, but they are usable. But it's going to push your requirement for the fidelity of teleportation up very close to what you need for um, your threshold calculation, wherever it is you can set your particular threshold, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, and you pick. Um, 
At the second level and above, essentially, this teleportation is your interconnecting, so, and so that's where that uh, derives from. And uh, that's sort of the take-home message from all of this, I think. Uh, thanks to my collaborators, Kohei Ito, Kai Nomoto, Bill Monroe, Thaddeus, who's giving a talk tomorrow, Austin Fowler, and uh, you'll find some of our work there. Um, I guess that's about it. Let's put up a couple of pictures of KO, since a lot of people don't know where KO is. And uh, Todd has been talking about the lovely Southern California weather. I just wanted to put up one nice picture that was taken up, uh, taken out on the beach just a few miles from here. I believe the guy up there blocking is, in fact, uh, USC's uh, director of supercomputing. <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Oh, come on, somebody's got a question. Darshan, set up. Okay, set up. <laughs> um, have we looked at other codes for the, other than the 913? The, the transactions on computers paper does have a discussion of the difficulty of creating distributed zeros for the uh, 713 code. Um, we have not looked at other codes other than that for nodes that are smaller than a logical qubit. So that, that paper also includes a discussion of you know, our preferred approach, actually, if you can get them all into one, one node, is two levels of the 2317 code, is what gives you that really robust behavior and allows 1% error rate in your uh, physical teleportation. Todd? Have you looked at uh, the possibility of differentiating your nodes a little more? So for instance, some of them may be more just memory and you're not uh, would you use different encodings in different areas? That's one of the first things that occurs to, to, a, to a, uh, a computer architecture person. Right? Well, we'll have the, the processing area over here and the memory area over there. Right? But then you go and you talk to, to a bunch of, of the physicists and it winds up that, that, that the difficulties Andrew Steens referred to a quantum computer as a device that does quantum error correction that also happens to, uh, kind of on the side, run an application level algorithm, right? And that's unfortunately seems to be true. Um, but there are cert there's certainly a lot of discussion of, for example, using nuclear spins as long-term storage for data and using electron spins for, for, your, for your calculation sorts of things. I haven't seen any results come out of that that, that I really think change the way we think about how to put the systems together yet. But I think it's a really um, ripe area for potential research. At the application level, I mean, you know, so the difference between nuclear spins and, and, and electron spins, you know, it's many orders of magnitude in terms of speed, right? Well, it turns out, at first glance, if you look at the application level algorithms, you're going to want that data back out of the nuclear spin in less than, in less than a, a nuclear spin operation time. Right? So maybe. I think I think it's a really good area to be looking at. Okay. Thank, Thank you again. You.